Good morning here from Sydney, Australia, but we do have people from all over the world joining us today, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's webinar, From Star Wars to Supermarkets, How Semiconductors Power the Universe. Uh, welcome. My name is Andrea Culligan. I'm the lead partner of innovation and our venture building capability here at Deloitte Australia, and I globally lead our emerging technology practice uh, really connecting our innovation into industry, specifically around climate sustainability. So today's topic is very pertinent. On behalf of Blue Glass and Share Cafe, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to today's expert panel discussion on the semiconductor industry, looking at trends, opportunities and challenges in a global context while also exploring Australia's role in this crucial sector in the decades ahead. Now, today, the global semiconductor industry represents a $600 billion a year opportunity. And as the world accelerates its transition to electrification and digitization, the industry is set to become a more than US $1 trillion a year sector by the end of the decade. Despite its critical importance locally, semiconductors are one of the least understood technologies and sectors. They're known as microchips, uh, but they are the most single important technology and they're underpinning almost every industry. They're essential for both the manufacture of and proper functioning of everything from smartphones, fridges, hair dryers, electric vehicles, advanced medical equipment, supercomputers, wireless comms and defense applications. They enable technology in every frontier from submarine and marine tech to terrestrial and aerial applications to our advancement to outer space, semiconductors power it all. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute has said, having unfettered access to microchips is a matter of economic and national security, and more generally of Australia's day-to-day -day well-being as a nation. In an increasingly digitized world, policymakers must treat semiconductors as a vital public good, almost on par with other necessities such as food and water supplies and reliable electricity. Historically, Australia's limited participation in the global semiconductor ecosystem has put it as a, at a geopolitical disadvantage. And with today's geopolitical developments and increasing techno-nationalism, Australia must make enormous strides to shore up its semiconductor security and build out its national capability and capacity in this critical space. Now we have an action-packed agenda today and joining us today to share their insights on the industry opportunities and challenge, challenges ahead is a stellar, pardon the pun, international guest list featuring industry pioneers and leaders to answer your questions on all things semiconductors. Now though, it's an absolute honor and a privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Suji Nakamura. Now, Professor Nakamura's pioneering work in the development of nitrate-based semiconductors represents one of the most important achievements in the materials science of semiconductors in the last 30 years. For his breakthrough work, he was awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize for Physics for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes, which has enabled light and energy saving white light sources. His achievements enabled the development of white LEDs that have revolutionized the lighting industry and have superior low energy consumption, resulting in significant energy savings. The professor is a professor of materials and electrical and computer engineering at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And today he joins us from Santa Barbara, at Santa Barbara after having a walk on the beach this morning, he shares with me. Um, so over to you, Professor Nakamura. We look forward to it. So I talk about, uh, you know, a silicon-based uh, semiconductor. Uh, using this semiconductor material, we can make an emitting device from UVC to red. So at the UCSB, we have a uh, uh, SLIC, uh, Solid State Lighting Energy Center. Through this center, we are developing all kinds of uh, devices using silicon nitrate semiconductors. So, uh, so one big application is uh, uh, all kinds of electron devices, power devices, RF devices. Uh, Professor Mesh is working for these uh, electron devices. Also another one is the uh, LED laser diode. Uh, Professor uh, Steve Denbass and I are working together to develop these devices. So one is the uh, LED. So today I don't talk about LED so much. Uh, today I talk about the mainly for laser diode. So basically LED right now we are working for the uh, uh, you know, UVC LED for sterilization, including COVID-19. Also micro LED, we are micro LED used for next generation display especially for a uh, bigger uh, market is the AR, VR. Also laser diodes, so this is a big topic, laser diodes. So we are developing a DFB laser, a big cell, edge emitting laser diodes. So these laser diodes use uh, laser lighting and the quantum computer. 
also the photocatalysis for the oil. So uh, this shows the uh, you know three nitrate uh, materials: aluminum nitrate, gallium nitrate, indium nitrate. These uh, binary semiconductors. So by mixing these binary uh, um, uh, materials, we can change the emission wavelengths of the emitting devices from 200, around 200 to 1.6 micron. And uh, so before 1993, only available uh, CD5 compounds, that means like gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, you know, you know, aluminum arsenide. So using this compound, only emitting devices, uh, people could make uh, emitting devices from the emission wavelengths longer than uh, 620, longer than red, red color. Only available main color is infrared. So, but after in 1993, invention of uh, blue LEDs using three night semiconductor, we can make the emitting devices from the red color to far UVC using only three nitrate semiconductor materials. So it, it's huge changes. So we can make you know, LED laser diode from uh, red to the far UVC now. So also this shows the uh, exchange of the uh, three primary color uh, LEDs, red, green, blue LEDs, as a function of developed years. So I include the laser diode too. So red LED are developed in 60s and the efficiency of red increased gradually like this. And uh, also blue and the green LED developed in 93, 95. Since 95, you know, three color primary LED are available. So that's the reason white LED are developed in 95 and white LED lighting used for the all kind of lighting in order to reduce energy consumption. Also laser diode is always, you know, Development delayed by the after uh, development LEDs. So red, uh, you know, red are developed here using same material as the ring gap, and uh, blue, green, red uh, laser diode developed using same material, silicon nitride semiconductors. Uh, blue and green laser are developed. So laser diode also now three primary color laser diode available. So you can make many kinds of colors, but still green is not so good. So right now, you know, a big application of the laser diode is a blue laser diode is a laser uh, automobile headlamp. You know, so LED automobile headlamp irradiation distance only 300 meter. Laser automobile headlamp is radiation is more than one kilometer. One kilometer. So in the view of the safety, much better using uh, laser lighting. And another big application is a projector, laser projector. Uh, all of new cinema use laser projector. Uh, blue is a high power blue laser diode. Green and the red come from phosphors. Those phosphors are excited by blue laser diode. And, uh, and uh, so now, you know, uh, you know, UCSB recently developed the uh, 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 distributed feedback laser diode. It's called the DFB laser. Using DFB lasers, we can make a single model uh, laser diode. So previously, uh, you know, for uh, lighting, we use a, a multi-mode laser diode, but now for special application, we use a single mode uh, laser diode. So this single mode laser diode has uh, also a, a lot of application. One is uh, visible light communication. It's called the Li-Fi, laser cooling, atomic clock, and also the uh, space uh, satellite communication, underwater communication. So, so this uh, single mode laser diode uh, used for this application. This is our UCSB single mode laser diode. And another big application, photonic uh, integrated cycle, photonic IC. So this photonic IC was very popular in the 80s, but the, you know, that like a boom, but the, that boom was gone away and now its boom is coming. And uh, photonic circuit in the, you know, right now silicon IC is made by electrical current, but the, the electric is uh, uh, light, just light as uh, you know, what to the make ice. Light means laser light. And uh, the wavelengths, you know, this shows the wavelengths uh, as a light, uh, light source of the uh, photonic IC. So wavelengths is, uh, you know, shorter than 620, or, the, uh, you know, they have to use three nitrate based, based laser dial. Application also written, my, <laughs> application micro machining, atomic clock, same thing quantum qubit, atomic physics, 
underwater communication, VR, AR, uh, display application. No? So this uh, photonic IC also is a huge market, but the uh, important thing is uh, a light source is a laser diode, you know. Also for special blue laser diodes, another big market is now the uh, uh, laser welding, cutting, also 3D printers. The advantage of blue laser diode is, uh, you know, this is absorption coefficients. So right now, you know, laser welding cutting, you, when you get automobile factory, you can see a huge, not, lot of number of the laser welding cutting. They already, right now they use the infrared laser diode here, 10, 16 nanometer infrared laser diode. But the absorption coefficient of the, this metal is very small using infra, infrared region. But the blue region, this material has you know, gold, copper, nickel, silver, aluminum as a huge, huge absorption coefficient. So it's easy, it's the best, blue is the best for the, uh, the welding cutting for these materials. This is blue laser there. Star Wars is also, they use blue laser gun. <laughs> Looks like blue laser gun. And uh, also another uh, important thing is application is uh, uh, laser fusion. You know, laser fusion, you know, this is laser fusion energy is the ultimate energy source. So LED was used to save energy, but the blue laser now could be used for the generate the new energy source for laser fusion. The last year, the Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory, National Emission Facility achieved a big breakthrough using laser fusion. You know, the input power. So they use a 351 nanometer laser. laser. This is a sister laser, laser. So they, you know, this is a, not a semiconductor laser, but the ultimate they have to the semiconductor laser to reduce the cost and the space. You know, so this is a three fifty one nanometer laser, and this is a you know fusion energy. So input laser energy is one point nine. This pulse pulse energy one point nine two megajoule, but output uh, energy one point seven three seven megajoule. This is by the is again is 72%, almost 100%. So input energy, output energy, almost same. This is a breakthrough, almost a break even. You know, so, so right now, still a problem is uh, laser power because uh, we need a high power laser. We need a petawatt laser power, petawatt. So right now, blue laser, in our case, uh, blue laser is uh, almost one watt, but uh, you know, petawatt. But uh, laser fusion is key is uh, laser technology to reduce the cost everything. In that case, we have to uh, brew uh, violet laser diode or brew laser diode in the long term. So this is ultimate energy. So now, uh, you know, LED is used for the, to save energy, but the laser diode is uh, to generate the nuclear power. Not, not the nuclear, but nuclear using nuclear fusion. This is ultimate, you know, safe energy. That's all. Thanks so much. Thank you, for Professor Nakamura. There, I'll tell you what I heard out of that that I think is really powerful. Mm -hmm. That the future innovation from semiconductors to future energy is pretty critical, and also the pace of which it's moving is pretty critical. And the innovation that's occurring from health to VR, AR to quantum, and how LED is changing the emissions reductions based on the different color of LEDs. And forgive me, I'm not an expert, but hearing what you're saying is really landing for me around the importance of this industry innovation in order for us to look at nuclear powered fusion energy or look at different future energies. Uh, you know, and of course, Star Wars using blue light, uh, you know, it's already predicting the future was, was predicted in the eighties um, and how it's impacting not only, uh, you know, a deep technology, our everyday technology, such as vehicle light efficiencies um, and health uh, capabilities as well. So thank you very much for setting the tone on the need for innovation and the need for this, in a, for this industry to, to really leverage. We're really appreciative of your time.
I'll now introduce the rest of the panel and we'll go into a series of questions. Please, by all means, uh, ladies and gentlemen attending the webinar today, you can uh, put your questions into the Q&A and we will uh, filter those and respond to those in, in the forum today. But just a, a few introductions of our expert panel that we're also really uh, delighted to have with us. We have industry luminary, uh, Professor Stephen Denbaz, and he is a professor of materials and computer engineering and co-director of the Solid State Lighting Center at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His pioneering work in GAN-based semiconductors has less, led to more than 800 scientific publications and over 160 US patents on electronic materials and devices. He's internationally recognized for his contribution to the industry and is an IEEE Fellow, an IEEE Aaron Kressel Award recipient and elected fellow of both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Inventors. Gosh. Um, I'm feeling very um, underachieving at this point in time. <laughs> Thank I mean, you very much. Enough. Enough <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. We can be here forever. Um, we're also joined by Global Photonics and laser leader Jean-Michel Pelleprat. Jean-Michel is a non-exec director of Blue Glass and the founder of Nubaru Incorporated, a recognized pioneer in blue lasers for industrial manufacturing 3D printing. Thank you so much for joining us, Jean-Michel. Paul Cooper is a chair of the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Center, where he oversees the design and implementation of the AMGC strategy and its alignment with the federal government's Growth Center Initiative. He has over 25 years of manufacturing industry experience and is the owner and exec chair of Rinstrom, an industrial electronics manufacturing company. Gosh, Paul, you would have seen some incredible changes to manufacturing over the last 25 years. Um, we're also joined uh, by geologist and minerals exploration leader uh, Rimas uh, Kairatis, which I really hope I pronounced correctly. And I think you even told me earlier, and I probably didn't do it very well, Kai Kairitis. As a managing director of Alpha HPA listed on the ASX, Alpha HPA's materials have direct application into the semiconductor sector for both phosphor synthesis and in the growth of sapphire substrates for chip production. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Semiconductors is not a small topic, um, and I see we've held our audience already for 20 minutes, so they are just pumped to hear what you have to say. We will be communicating as a panel for the next half an hour or so, but we will have some time for questions, and we will try to get through them as well. My first question today is for Steve. Um, semiconductors are the single most important technology underpinning the proper functioning of everything from smartphones to submarines, also lightings, as we mentioned. Can you give a brief overview of how they indeed power the universe? Well, that's a, that's a good question, Dear General. But, you know, semiconductors basically allow us to control the flow of electricity and, and basically make electricity intelligent. We can create uh, binary logic, which then lets us do smart things. And it, semiconductors are then this key material that is basically gone from just being used in personal computers 30 years ago to basically now it's everywhere. It's in your light bulb. It's in your cell phone. It's in the solar cells for renewable energy. It's even in the electric cars that everybody's doing. The key drive electronics is made with either silicon or silicon carbide or gallium nitride, these so-called new advanced compound semiconductors. And so it's literally powering your car uh, and it's even powering the lights if you do the solar uh, thing. And so it, it's it's just amazing to, for me to see it go from just being used to chips and computers to now all these smart devices. It's in your washing machine. I just bought a new. So it, it just, that's why we say it's really starting to power our universe and it does it with such great energy efficiency. And I think that's what's really given growth to this huge market. I, I love that. and and. But, but, you know, we've also heard, yes, semiconductors are, and chips are in everything, but there's also a shortage and it's affecting the availability of a number of products. And we've seen that in things like cars and electronics and even your fridge, I would imagine, would, may have had a delay. And they estimate, you know, experts are, are really estimating that this global chip shortage will knock a full percentage or it did knock a full percentage point off the U.S. GDP last year. How did this happen? And also, how do we prevent this from happening again? If it isn't everything, it's so impactful and important. Yeah, I, you know, what really happened is what happened over the last 20, 30 years is just a very few companies and countries got really good control and almost like a monopoly of the ability to supply these advanced semiconductors. And also, the we had an explosion of new uses. And so what happened, you know, what happened really was with COVID is COVID started making the supply chain very difficult. 
But as everybody sat at home and talking on their devices and wanting to Zoom, suddenly we had even a, a bigger need for somebody. So it's like a double whammy. And yeah. then, uh, you know, we'll just say there was, a, I don't want to name which companies, but th then you only had really one big fab, uh, foundry company and a lot of the other semiconductors, they wouldn't provide it to their competitors. So there was really only a, a couple countries that could be a foundry service. Combine that with the COVID and everybody wanting compound semiconductor, you have a huge supply chain um, shortage. I mean, we're starting to, it's starting to look better now, but that's only because the other companies have now started to ramp up and, and you know, it, but it's really been that explosion of, of uses we had combined with, you know, over the years, it used to be like 20 companies had semiconductor fabs, but that kind of shrunk as, as a, a couple got really good at it. And now we're seeing, yeah, more companies and countries invest in it. Yeah, so so we're seeing this kind of balance of big end of town who's captured a market, and then another end of town that's probably innovating fast and trying to catch up or perhaps take over other market shares by the sound of things. And there's probably it sounds like there's a bit of a gap. Um, Jean Michel, yeah. you know, when people hear the word semiconductors, Jean Michel, they they typically think of or we've spoken about chips for computers. Um, but you know, when we think about other technologies that fall under the semiconductor umbrella. Well, I'd love to know what are those uh, those big scale usages outside of chips for computers? What you know? What what would you say are, are some of those considerable uses? Uh, in a simple way, so the the semiconductors used in chips, as you mentioned, for computers or the consumer electronics devices, and which has been very pervasive, right? In our it's in our appliances and everywhere, right? Uh, is usually based on silicon semiconductor technology. But there's another class of uh, semiconductors called compound semiconductors, which operate uh, differently and also serve different and complementary applications, such as uh, power electronics, you know, optical communications, as well as a large number of photonics applications. You know, compound semiconductors is also a core technology for low and high power semiconductor lasers and LEDs that both uh, uh, Steve mentioned and uh, Professor Nakamura mentioned as well. Now, I've got a, a curly question, but I'd, I'd love to see, Jean-Michel, if you're able to respond, and it's really about the geopolitical tensions. Um, I, I'd love to hear your point of view, or if you'd rather divert to another panelist <laughs> on this one. Um, the semiconductor industry is being impacted by a lot of these geopolitical tensions between the US and China, and Taiwan is firmly sitting in the middle. What does that mean for the US production? Uh, maybe Steve can answer. That. Maybe I'll give you. A, you know, there was, a, as you know, the Chip Act that uh, the current administration has passed here, and I think the intent here is really strategic and also job creation and reshoring. As Steve mentioned, uh, you know, the semiconductor industry has migrated and be outsourced for you know some decades, you know, outside the U.S. And there is a combination of. Uh, key interest here, particularly in the US. One is strategic to essentially control, you know, research and manufacturing and even keep captive some of those applications for defense, for instance, application. Also, as Steve mentioned, the supply chain has been heavily disrupted here. And there is certainly a demand to have a supply chain much closer at home to the factories and, and the research centers and whomever need this. So, that is really, a, a, you know, an, an, you know what I would call it a strategic interest to do this. But the other aspect is reshoring a large industry that has been outsourced over the past decade, primarily to, uh, to China, uh, that is, is core to uh, recreate here in the U.S. Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything to this, or maybe you have a different view on that. <laughs> no, Jean-Michel, I think that, that you really got the key points. I, I, I just might add that you know, uh, I saw over 20 years that actually the the U.S. kind of take a sense that, oh, we don't need to fund semiconductors anymore. Somebody will just make it for us. And they kind of just were became reliant on other people. And they and, and now it's it's gone full force and they've decided to reinvest it. But, you know, Australia also has some great homegrown technology. Uh, for instance, uh, Blue Glass developed something called, a uh, you know, this remote plasma CVD, which is really unique that I'm looking at. And that's an innovation that we can we work with them and uh, you know put it in the new devices. So I think each country needs to maintain a competency in, in this technology. If you don't, it would be almost like if people gave up software programming and you just left what country yeah. to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, you don't want that to happen. You need semiconductors. Everybody, you know, innovation. I've seen innovation happen in Israel. I've seen it happen in Europe. And so the Chips Act is just kind of trying to say, okay, you know, we're going to bring it back and we're going to we're going to make it favorable even for foreign companies to come in and manufacture in the U.S. Uh, so that the Chips Act is also. I think there's uh, one company from Taiwan and one from Korea building fabs now in the U.S. because of that. Perfect. Let, let and. and uh, to me, Sorry, to me yeah. something that I think out of nitride is probably, which is really the business than, than uh, blue glass is in, is a little bit different than that. It's probably an exception because if you look where the uh, geographical segmentation is purely manufacturers in Europe, primarily in Germany, in Japan, and also in Taiwan. Um, and it's, it, it's, it, it's actually a bit easier in terms of the supply chain than the other semiconductors. So that's a little bit unique in some way. Also, a fair amount of research in those countries, including obviously in the U.S. Yeah. Thanks, Jean-Michel. Paul, you're right at the coalface within Australia and able to see how this has impact from a cost, benefit, increase, innovation. What does the industry look like? You know, and even reflecting on the most recent comments on this panel, how does that now impact Australia from a benefit as well as what a consideration should be? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Look, I'll speak to it on a couple of levels. So one, uh, firstly, I'll, I'll speak about uh, my experience at Rindstrom in the recent uh, year uh, with uh, with chips and supply. Um, and if I then uh, also talk about what Australia is doing and what it can do, what is strategically what it's capable of doing uh, in our location and with the funds we've got available. So firstly, we spoke about um, the global supply chain issues that are occurring in uh, in chips and microelectronics more generally. Um, now, my my company, Rinstrom, uh, easiest way to describe it is we make things that weigh things. Um, so we're in industrial weighing technology. Um, now that requires uh, a lot of electronics, and we don't refer to it as a global supply chain at the, anymore. We're calling it the global surprise chain uh, because. Every week, we're getting more surprises coming with our uh, with our components, and uh, we're getting uh, suppliers providing us with lead times uh, where they would normally run a particular chipset uh, globally for the for the global market. It's every 13 weeks or every 20 weeks. Um, some of them pushing out to 86 week cycles. Now that's meant my, me reinvesting millions of dollars into inventory to ensure that I've got supply for my products going forward. Multiply that right across uh, industry and we're finding inventories are rising. And it's it's not so much, you know, people are saying, well, all you're doing is buying just in case instead of just in time. It's absolutely crucial. We cannot change components in our product because we have trade approved uh, weighing gear. And we, you know, to change a chip means that we've got to resubmit to each of the testing authorities around the world. And that is a very time consuming and very expensive process. So as a user of, of chip technology, um, we've had to very rapidly come to the market and understand where the particular pinch points are and how do we continue with uh, you know, turning our global supply chain into a global continued supply chain. And I think back to the start of COVID uh, no one knew anything, probably most people couldn't spell the word epidemiology. Um, and, you know, overnight, um, just about everyone is now an expert in epidemiology and has opinions on what's, uh, what governments are doing. I think what we're going to see in the next 12 months is exactly the same with microprocessor and semiconductor technology. People are really going to have to get their head around it. We're going to have to understand uh, what the global supply chain is and where the manufacturing risk is. So the manufacturing risk is currently around global concentration of fabs. And that's what we've got to try and uh, work out how we then use our other trade deals, our, F, our free trade agreements, FTAs around the world, uh, our AUKUS deals. Does Australia need to have complete capability and capacity in chip production right across the whole spectrum? Well, I don't think so. We need to move and ensure that through our free trade agreements and our defence pacts that we have access to uh, continued supply to assist with our sovereign uh, capability and sovereign capacity. So part of that question, I think, talking about the Australian market in general terms, we, we have a very small number of uh, companies in Australia with the technology that Blue Glass has, very few. 
Um, it's a bit like the Australian manufacturing industry uh, more broadly. You know, we have 47,000 manufacturers in Australia, of which about 90% uh, of the revenue comes from about 10% of the manufacturers, 90% of our export revenue and GDP. Think of the microelectronics and semiconductor part of that within Australia, and it is even more concentrated. So what Australia does very well is compete on value, not cost. We will never be a long-term, low-cost uh, production facility. What we need to concentrate on is the areas of manufacturing where Australia can shine. So just briefly, there are seven phases of manufacture. It's the areas of production, so the, the, the middle bit, everyone talks about manufacture thinking it's production, it's not. R&D, design, logistics, production, delivery, sales and servitization, they are all components of manufacture. What Australia does really well is in those distal points of that smiley curve, is, is in the design, is in the research and development, translating research from universities into practice. Absolutely, Australia is world leaders in that. Our design capabilities are paramount. Logistics, we have to be good at because we were located on the planet. Production has to be efficient and it may not even be in Australia. But then look at delivery to our, our customers, our sales and our servitization. Again, at the servitization side of it, where we add value through things such as, um, you know, compare it to say the Apple apps side of it. That's what Australia does well. So I think where the government throwing in, um, you know, the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, one and a half billion of that is going towards uh, manufacturing, focusing on sovereign capability and sovereign capacity. There is an opportunity to assist manufacturers to get you know, the foot on the ground, to get a step up, move through that valley of death and try to find ways of efficiently doing the manufacturing in Australia, broadly defined, um, to be globally competitive. So that's, that's where the, the government is moving to try and build that uh, capacity and capability for Australia. I love that lens, Paul, because it's talking about Australia as an innovation nation and not necessarily needing to play across the whole of the value chain of that innovation and really just sticking to to the knitting of what we're good at. So I, I love that lens. Uh, Remus, you are kind of looking at the different side of the value chain around semiconductors and Australia's got a, a really rich mineral rare earth deposit, many of which will become very important as the market transitions to compound semiconductors. How do you see Australia's role in supplying the global industry from this space? Thanks, Andrea. I think um, the best way for me to answer that is through the lens of our own experience. Um, and I think the best way to set that up is that over the last sort of six to 12 months, uh, our company, which produces a range of sort of very high purity aluminium materials, um, our company has seen a significant uptick in inbound interest of um, counterparties in the in the semiconductor sector, um, particularly in the US over the last six months, and particularly as it relates to. Um, materials actually in the polishing slurries for the for the semiconductor substrates um, that has been a significant sort of in, um, inbound interest and we think you know clearly stimulated by this reshoring theme and 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 the sort of macro environment around the chips act in in the us i think um, in addition um, that has translated into the other sort of sector outside of chips themselves is the sort of LED semiconductor sector, which we've also seen a lot more inbound interest in the last 12 months in the development of both substrates, sapphire substrates for LED lighting and in illuminate garnet phosphors, which um, Professor Nakamura referenced a couple of times, both in medical lasers and um, micro LED lighting appear to be um, driven by th those, those thematics appear to be building driven by, by both Chips Act and 
I guess, geopolitics as well to some degree. So here is where Australia can be very useful. Um, we have, as you mentioned, a very well-established resource base and what we are doing and what we would encourage other participants in the Australian resource sector is that you taking, we are taking a product which is in already manufactured in, in Australia, which is, which is a sort of intermediate aluminium material, um, applying a technology to value add and in our case, that value add is purification and then customization to, to customers um, and capturing, capturing that value add here in Australia. So being able to then deliver a product into the semiconductor sector, which is you know, geopolitically stable. And the benefit, of course, for Australia is that you're value adding to an existing, an existing industry. Um, what's key, though, is having the technology to do that. And, and we're fortunate enough to have developed that and sort of just picking up on some of Paul's comments is also um, having Australian government support at various levels for what we're doing. And, and we've been very fortunate enough to enjoy some support actually from the AMGC where Paul shares, but also um, um, up to $60 million worth of government grant monies, which, which are going to accelerating our, our production centre in, in Gladstone in Queensland. Um, so I think the government has definitely got the memo and is looking to support advanced manufacturing in Australia. And I'd like to think that um, what our business does, what Alpha HPA does in terms of applying technology, value adding to the industry um, and then supporting you know, supporting this reshoring effort, um, offering a really stable jurisdictional supply um, in Australia is is a win win both for Australia and and the sector. And um, I think, you know, that there are other, of course, other resource businesses and other resource based industries in Australia looking to do the same. And we think we think it's a fantastic opportunity for us and also the industry more broadly. Thanks, Remus. And um, for those listening, Remus is, I love that COVID has created an environment where we can attend from anywhere in the world. Remus is in an airport lounge in Brisbane. So if you, hear, if you do hear background noise, um, it's, uh, it's the fact that we are all over the world today. Steve, I wanted to turn to you because one of the major ways we rely on semiconductors today is around lighting. And you have predicted that the way we interact with light will radically change potentially removing the need for electric copper wiring to power overhead lighting. And the central overhead lighting system may become as much of a thing of the past as the oil lantern. Now, can you tell us how the future of lighting is laser? Because copper is an interesting topic and how that all inter interlinks. I'd really love to hear why, you know, what is your thoughts around the future of lighting? Yeah, so the future of lighting. So one of the things that you just, people want to know how you get rid of copper wires. Well, we basically power the lights with uh, fiber optics. So you you run the light up in a fiber optics. So you could have a laser, just one laser for your house or LED source could power the, all the lights in your house by directing. So you use photons down the, the fiber. So that was kind of that first answer. But where, where I see it changing is that the light is now not just for you to read or light by, but it's, it's being used to communicate data and information. Because once you have the light bulb, we now then can modulate it very fast that your eye can't see it. So basically it's it's called uh, free space communication. Another word of this is light, Li-Fi or light fidelity, which is the light analogy of Wi-Fi. So instead of using, you know, um, you know, radio frequency waves, we're using light waves. So that's another way, but you know, it's already happening. Your cell phone already has a LIDAR sensor in it, which detects your face. Um, we're already using LIDAR for autonomous driving. And so, it's just people coming up with more and more uses for lighting and light that it just lets your light system become smarter than just being a, a light bulb. And so I think that's the future of, of lighting with lasers is that it makes it more intelligent and more controllable. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about Li-Fi? So we heard a little bit about that through Professor Nakamura's presentation, but uh, can you tell us more about the development of that and what the potential of that is? Yeah, so Li-Fi, like I said, it's it's where you you modulate the light source. So the, the advantage of it is that we can communicate at very high data rates, uh, similar to fiber optics. So we can do a, what's called a terabit per second. 
So this is like sending the Library of Com Commerce out over your room in a, in, a, in a second or something like that. And so then we need to make the detectors that can read that light source. So it could be your phone. So you won't, right now it takes you several seconds to download a movie. You would download a movie in the blink of an eye with a Li-Fi system because it, it basically can operate at these very, very high speeds uh, because we can transmit so much data with it. We can do what's called wavelength division multiplexing, which is we just move the wavelengths a little bit so we can fit more information. So uh, like I said, li Li-Fi is kind of like a very nascent industry. We're still looking for the killer application. One of it may be gaming because it turns out if you have a headset, which is virtual reality, you need to communicate vast amounts of data to it very quickly. So that might be one where we have a Li-Fi transmitter, but uh, we just see it as another way to do communication and it's also very efficient and very cheap. Awesome. And, you know, when we look at the future, I always talk about climate tech in particular as an emerging technology. And this, uh, there's a lot of the conversation we're referring to here that is about reducing emissions, which of course has impact on climate sustainability. The, the, the growth phases are fundamentally much larger and much faster than they've ever been before. And everything from manufacturing to how we, uh, how we look at resources and commodities and how we even extract them, how all the way through th to the value chain is, is changing so rapidly. And it's fascinating to hear the ap applications of these multi-technologies. And when I, I talk about space technology sometimes around Earth observation and that uh, the technology that we use on satellites can also be applicable here on land. And I refer to the analogy, which is my simplistic mind, uh, between whiskey and gin. And that when we look at how you distill whiskey and gin, the manufacturing of this is the same, but of course the output requires different tenure of distilling or different applications in the final makings of the manufacturing. However, the, gen the general force of whiskey and gin is actually exactly the same. Um, and Paul, you kind of referenced uh, uh, some of that in, in what you mentioned as well. Um, so, John Michelle, just just one question to you. You know, obviously the chips legislation has come in, and it's designed to really kickstart that industry and expansion. But what do you see are the key megatrends and the key forces that are really driving, or the applications that are driving this need around future growth and and, and the need for this legislation? Oh, gosh, I'm afraid you're on mute, Jean-Michel, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. All right. I think you should hear me now, right? So uh, maybe I should, I'd like to focus a little bit more on, on my background, which is the uh, semiconductor lasers and more specifically the gallium nitride, which is relevant to blue glass here. But here are some of the trends or the, the driving demand, if you like. One is, you know, industrial application. That's the one that I'm very familiar with. You know, I co-founded Nuburu about seven years ago, and we make and, and ship a lot of lasers for uh, welding and 3D printing around the world. So here it's driving on the electrification of the world. Uh, as uh, Professor Nakra mentioned earlier, if you look at all the metals, when you want to weld metals, in the blue, the absorption is enormous, right? Copper, for instance, the absorption in copper is 14 times higher than it is in the infrared, which is the incumbent laser being used for welding. And uh, copper is everywhere in terms of the electrification of the world. It is in, uh, in batteries, it is in the electrical vehicle, it is in the e-bikes, the truck, the buses, it is in the energy storage. So what the blue does here, the smic up the blue does here, is really a very efficient, pro extremely efficient process. It's going fast. It also makes extremely high quality uh, uh, and very affordable products. So it's a next generation essentially of manufacturing. And this is all driven by the electrification of the world. The other one, which I think is very critical is the metal 3D printing. The driving factor is also reshoring. You know, if you can actually 3D print uh, parts, you can, you know, you can do that on the plant where you do the final assembly. It, it's all benefits. You have actually a local supply chain. In fact, if you look to the automotive manufacturers, particularly in the US and Europe, they are interested, they are massively interested to invest into 3D printing, where blue has a tremendous advantage here. And the reason is to have it captive. In fact, they are speaking about 3D printing farms. 
So they're actually stopping the, the supply chain and they're actually creating the supply chain around a Ford plant or a GM plant or a Volkswagen plant, for instance. Okay. So this is the really second one. Um, we've talked about uh, the lighting and the laser projector, but this is, you know, very pervasive. You know, there's such a demand of lighting around the world everywhere, not only personal, but in the street and everywhere that there is a, an enormous demand here. Uh, and the gallium nitride is the key supplier to that. And let me add a few more things. You know, I, I've been working more than 40 years in the laser industry is when you develop technology and look at application, you're thinking about a certain number of applications. And then it turns out that you actually found a lot more applications and different applications, which are even bigger. So we are just at a genesis, I think, of what the gallium nitride can do. Uh, we certainly have identified, you know, industrial applications, projections, biosensing, biomedical, medical applications, quantum computing. But there are going to be a large number of other applications that are going to be developed in the next decade and two decades, that some of them would be even bigger than that. Paul, I'd love your thoughts from the Australian lens. You know, what does Australia need to do? What should be some of the areas to really capitalize on? And when we're looking at different industrial demand and production, what should be some of the focus areas or some of the considerations? And, and what should Australia be thinking about? So following on from Jean-Pichel's um, commentary there about some major pivots that are happening globally, uh, none of those things happen uh, on their own. There's al always second and third order consequences to those particular actions. Um, going back to uh, the commentary at the CHIPS Act and, uh, and the administration's uh, commentary last week of encouraging uh, global American executives back into the United States, uh, through a carrot and stick approach. I won't go into any further detail on that. You can easily find that uh, on the internet. But um, that has other consequences. So if, if those executives do leave China and they will be looking for another home, uh, they may end up back in the United States and, and start the, uh, the rebuilding of, say, the, the building of the TSMC plant, uh, the, uh, the expansion of NVIDIA and AMD technologies within the United States. What does that effect have on Australia? It means that at the same time as there's major upscaling occurring in other parts of the world, in non-China other parts of the world, then the cost of that technology of being able to do that in Australia rapidly increases. It's like trying to get, it's like trying to get your house repaired after a flood. Believe me, I'm right in that moment. So uh, all the costs are massively increased because of the demand for those particular materials at the same time. So the the equipment to make the, the chips, you know, to get the fab plants up and going, uh, are going to be highly in demand. And that is going to have those second and third order consequences for Australia. So where does Australia play in this? If you uh, look at where we where we could step into this and lean into production of some uh, areas, I think the, the the model that Blue Glass have, which is focused on niche technology, um, understand what we do well and scale that, is absolutely the right methodology. The Australian government um, and I've had I'm on my tenth minister now. Um, uh, over the years uh, since 2014 and it has been a consistent message that they want to increase the sovereign capability and sovereign capacity of manufacturing in Australia. So that's the will. So how does that translate into actual production? Uh, it can be done and uh, Rimas uh, mentioned a little earlier that uh, AMGC was, uh, was able to assist uh, Alpha HPA in their very early stages to, to prove their technology to the to their board and the investors and then scale up from there and were able to then prove to other governments of, of that they could expand. Um, you look at Blue Glass uh, also AMGC was great it was great to be able to partner with them in the early stages. Um, other companies in the cutting edge technology such as the Graphene Manage, Manu, Manufacturing Group GMG Group uh, based here uh, in Brisbane and proven the technology with a small amount of seed funding from the federal government that they then rapidly expanded. They're now listed on the Toronto Ventures Board, the TSXV, and have taken that, that product to the world. So 
this is where the, the Australian government has focused on trying to find those niche technologies and bring them to scale. It's not up to government to fund that scale. And where the Australian capital markets need to step in, uh, as your investors in Blue Glass have done, is back that technology and allow that technology to grow organically locally here and then with accelerated uh, investment. It's not up to the government to, to underwrite that growth. We will, we will certainly assist where we see some national benefits, um, but we also need to look at what the Australian capital markets uh, are doing and how we can add more money into the Australian capital markets to, to grow that production capacity here in Australia. Oh, Paul, that's a great lean in and I've got very limited time, but I do have two questions and I've been feeding them through from the audience as well. Um, Remus, just one question for you. You've got more than 20 years experience in the resources sector. It's the best understood, best funded sector. And in your current role, you're focusing on supplying Australia's least understood sector, despite its global importance around semiconductors. But in making the move, what have you noticed about the difference in attracting funding and supporting uh, support from both industry and government. Paul's just spoken about the need, but what have you noticed about the difference? Uh, I think, yeah, I think I think you're right that Australia's resource industry is extremely sophisticated and the investor audience around it is equally sophisticated. So I think um, in, in Australia, we investors understand resources extremely well. Um, we, as you say, as we, as we sort of, matured the business and moved it downstream. Um, our experience is that has been supported um, by, by the investor base um, and the government assistance that has been referenced a couple of times has helped, uh, certainly helped bring investors along to the extent that um, there's a degree of validation from the government and implied and real support for downstream value add. Uh, so our experience has been to date that the investment community is um, interested in supporting value add um, and maybe a little bit outside this sector, but but you'll see an, a number of resource companies value adding into the electron vehicle sector. So taking, you know, their raw materials and value adding and, and supplying in that sector. And that, that's a sector that, that our business is also very exposed to, but the semiconductor sector, I think, is is no different. Um, it's it's just finding the way to take what we already do well, uh, apply a technology, value add, and then and then feed into into the sector more broadly um, and becoming becoming a participant in that supply chain. Um, so I think, yeah, you're. To, our experience is is that investors are interested and supportive to date um, for, for that and um, and the government assistance and doing that with government assistance is has been um, has been has been uh, very beneficial I think and, and and is very helpful across that sector yeah excellent so the coupling of both industry and public sector is really critical in order for you to be successful um, Jean Michel very briefly uh, because I have one final question for Steve before we finish this webinar in four minutes um, Jean Michel infrared co2 lasers are noted for the power which is required for welding and 3d printing how do you get the required power levels for these applications from relatively low power GAN devices and I realize that's a big question for a short space of time Oh, it's very simple. So you actually aggregate uh, those devices together. If I take the example of uh, Nubur, for instance, there's another company, LaserLine, for instance, in Germany, they take bars, which is multiple devices, and they go from actually uh, three watts, four watts, which is per device, to actually hundreds of watts, even kilowatts. And then when you get to kilowatt and you preserve what's called the brightness, the brightness is very critical. The brightness is the ability to make a very small spot. So you aggregate them optically, you combine them together, you fiber couple them, and there you go. You have a fiber, you put the lens at the end, and you have a welding station or a 3D printing station. So doing it this way, you can go to half a kilowatt, the kilowatt, or even three kilowatts today. That is the power level that you need and you have today and delivered today to actually do welding into some of the application I mentioned earlier in energy storage and for electrical vehicles. Wow, that was 
so well <laughs> described. Even I understood it, um, which probably saying something. I have one final question uh, before we wrap up this incredible panel. Um, Stephen, you're based in Silicon Valley. What are the one or two things we should be learning from the fast growth environment that you're coming from that Australia can really capitalize on? Well, I think one thing we see in Silicon Valley and in California in general, uh, in some other places like Boston, is that there's a very rich um, academic environment which favors the university researchers filing patents. So there's funds available for university professors and their students to file patents. But then there, you know, we even have venture capitalists. Suji doesn't even want to tell this story, but we had a, a breakthrough invention and we put it out in press. We had a venture capitalist, one of the most famous venture capitalists, Vinod Kosla. We had never met him. He read it. He came, flew down from Silicon Valley to meet with us and said, you guys should commercialize this. So the the venture capitalists, the, the people with the really big money to grow the the invention or the innovation uh, are are readily available in Silicon Valley, and that's rare. And and you know now they're going all over the world and looking at. So I think if Australia could team up with the uh, you know growing a better venture capital market would be good. Uh, that would be a big help. But also the government, you know, that breakthrough Suji and I had was funded by the government, and it was uh, it was in lasers at the time, and they were you know other people were funding other stuff. So the Government's really key, I think, for the not for the big capital, like somebody mentioned, but for funding that innovation uh, and that whatever that it's advanced manufacturing or, you know, sometimes it's even basic research that makes the breakthrough. So it's kind of you need all three of those pillars um, to be successful. And uh, I think that's what Australia should be looking to do is get the government involved, get the venture capitalists involved. Excellent. Um, I, I've been humbled to listen to all of you today. What an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge that all of you have brought to the table today. I'd love to also thank so much to the event organizers, Blue Glass Limited and Share Cafe for bringing this event series together. We really look forward to bringing you our next expert roundtables, highlighting the future of quantum computing and Australia's role in the quantum revolution. And our final panel, taking a deep dive into the investment opportunities in semiconductors in Australia, to Steve's point. And most especially, thank you to our incredible audience of all of whom who have shared and stayed with us the entire hour. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you again to the panelists and thank you today for your time.